Exploring Chiropractic, Episode 35, Chiropractic Science with Dr. Dean Smith. For me, sitting around all day is not going to pay the bills. So I teach, I, I do research, I still have a practice part-time, I do continuing ed. It seems like my day's filled up. Maybe that's one of the reasons I do the podcast, maybe to generate some ideas and, and talk with the best of the best. Are you about ready to graduate, ready to launch your practice? Have you wanted to start a custom blog or make some money with an online business while in school? Whatever your thing is, your domain name is an important part and Hover can help you register it without the hassle. You can go to those other guys, they'll try to upsell you on every little thing like a dedicated virtual private cloud server, whatever the heck that is. But Hover keeps it simple. They'll help you take care of your domain and get out of the way when you're on to whatever's next. You can get your domain name for as little as $5.99 and they have awesome support over the phone, email, chat, even Twitter. Check out Hover because every great idea deserves a great domain name. Go to exploringchiropractic.com slash hover. If you like Exploring Chiropractic, please stick around after the interview for two ways that you can help make future episodes possible. Welcome back to Exploring Chiropractic, the only student chiropractic podcast. I'm Dr. Nathan Cashin. My guest in this episode is a clinical faculty member in the Department of Kinesiology and Health at Miami University in Ohio. He also maintains a private practice at Essence of Wellness Chiropractic Center, and he is the founder and host of the Chiropractic Science Podcast, dedicated to publicizing chiropractic research through podcast interviews with leading chiropractic scientists. We discuss Dr. Smith's journey through chiropractic, his own personal research interests, and how he's able to have personal discussions with the leading scientists in the profession. I hope you enjoy my interview with Dr. Dean Smith. Dr. Smith, thank you for joining me on Exploring Chiropractic. Well, thank you very much for asking. It's uh, a great opportunity to be here. I've been listening to your podcast for quite some time. I I don't remember exactly how I first came across it. Probably just searching iTunes for other chiropractic podcasts. And I was so excited because I personally have an interest in research. Um... I, I've thought about it as a you know future career opportunity, and here I see interviews with uh, um, with people like Scott Haldeman um, and you know other big names, Heidi Havik, of course. Uh, and it was it's been so great to just sit and listen to these people explain their past, their history, as well as their experience in research. So thank you so much for for starting the podcast and bringing these people kind of into my pocket so I can take them wherever I go. Thanks for listening. I want to start, as you often do, and let the listeners hear a little bit about your past. So what got you into chiropractic? Well, it seemed like there were many experiences that uh, seemed to get me to go into the chiropractic path. Um, initially, I had a knee injury from playing soccer, and I, I actually played a lot of different sports when I was young. Um, curling. Have you ever heard of curling before? Oh yeah. Up in Canada. Yeah, the... <laughs> yeah for sure. So <laughs> what a lot of Americans call the most boring sport ever to exist, <laughs> but it can actually get very exciting during the Olympics. It, it can. So, uh, anyways, I had a knee injury. I was playing these sports and running and, and all sorts of things. And, um, my knee injury just wasn't going away. And, uh, as I recall, I went to our medical physician at the time and he thought, I should rest for several weeks and take some pain medication if I needed. But the the weird thing is, uh, at the time, I, like I say, I guess I was about eight or something like that. Um, going into his office, I don't recall that he ever really touched my knee. Uh, and, uh, you know, he gave me some what I thought were halfway decent recommendations. But, um, you know, when you're a kid, you want to you wanna play. You don't want to stop. So my mother took me to see a chiropractor. And as I recall, uh, a neighbor of ours, uh, let us know about their chiropractor. So that's how we got to know about it. So anyways, we went to this chiropractor, uh, they touched my knee, uh, examined my spine and explained that 
I had some issues in both of these areas. So he adjusted my knee as well as my spine on that very first visit. And I recall feeling uh, a bit better right away. And after a few more visits, I was back to playing soccer and, and uh, doing all the things I used to. And, and the, the really important part of what I want to um, let you know and let your listeners know is that I actually felt stronger and I, I felt um, I felt better in many different ways, actually, that was hard to quantify at the time. Um, I participated better in sports and whatnot. And, uh, so my, my knee injury was just, uh, miles better. So, um, and, and I, as I've looked back on that incident, uh, over the years, I also had, um, been playing hockey for many years being, uh, you know, born in Canada, I was on ice skates, uh, since I was about two. And, um, there was, it seemed like every time I played hockey after about 15 or 20 minutes on the ice of probably lumbar flexion, low back flexion, I, I would get this pain in my low back. It wasn't anything too unbearable or anything, but it was uncomfortable. And after I got uh, my first set of adjustments, I, I never had those issues again. And, you know, I never really told anybody I had them in the first place, uh, but, uh, cause I didn't want to be a wimp or anything, but, uh, I never had them again. So, uh, so that's basically how I got into it. My, my brother also, um, had seen this chiropractor that I was seeing and he had some mid back pain at the time, some mild back pain, but he also had asthma. And after a few weeks of chiropractic care, uh, he didn't require the, um, the inhalers anymore like he used to. So that was interesting. He became a chiropractor. He's a chiropractor today as well. And, uh, one other thing that when I think about why I am doing what I do, and probably one of the reasons why I do the kind of research I do as well, is that um, I, I play a lot of golf, and and the golf game really was what got me to the States. I played in a golf scholarship. But when I was a junior, um, I I just felt like when I got adjusted, I had better performance. And so as my brother was going through chiropractic college at CMCC, uh, he would, uh, he was so kind to work on me before important golf tournaments and whatnot. And I just felt like my performance was so much better, uh, when I had the opportunity to get adjusted prior. So like I say, uh, that that's basically what my research is. Uh, if we, if we have any time to talk about that, I'd be happy to, but, uh, that's what my research is all about now is yeah, trying to look course. at the performance, yeah. uh, the performance effects of chiropractic. So that's, uh, hopefully not too long, but that's how I got into it. All right. Yeah. I'll be interested to touch on that. Yeah. It's a, it's, it seems to be a common story where, uh, someone goes for a particular injury and then notices other things improving. I would always tell friends, you know, when I went to a chiropractor that I would just leave feeling like I actually was finally standing up straight. And I got a lot of very strange looks, uh, about that, but just being able to move better and feel better in general. Uh, really made me curious about what was going on behind the scenes, I guess. Absolutely. Your brother went to CMCC. Did you also go in, uh, go to school in Canada? I did not. No, I, I went to school at national college of chiropractic in Lombard. Um, I had considered actually going to CMCC in, in Toronto, uh, because, uh, of growing up there and because my brother had gone there as well. And, and, uh, you know, obviously he had a lot of connections and I, I did go and visit the campus several times. Uh, but at the time you needed a bachelor's degree to be accepted and I didn't have a bachelor's degree. So I needed, I think it was, uh, just over a little bit over one more semester to finish things up. And at the time I really wanted to go straight into chiropractic college um, as I, uh, might've mentioned, I played in a golf scholarship here in the United States, uh, at Miami university where I teach and do research now. And, uh, it just seemed like, uh, you know, I, I, I loved being here in the States and I wanted to come down and do the schooling. And, and, uh, like I said, I didn't have the bachelor's degree, so it, it seemed to be a, uh, you know, a great opportunity to stay down here. So I applied to national, um, I got accepted there and, and thankfully one thing that I'd encourage all, um, uh, students to do or, uh, students who are considering chiropractic colleges to look out for any scholarships that the schools may have. Many of the scholarships, at least at the time that I applied 
for uh, offered scholarships, but you had to apply for them prior to being accepted. And so I did that, and I ended up getting a scholarship for foreign students, it was called, and uh, that ended up lasting actually the entire uh, time that I was at National. So it was a really huge savings for me um, and, and just a great opportunity. I'm glad you mentioned that. I think most students don't take advantage of scholarship opportunities. And part of the reason is that they are uh, quite rare or at least difficult to find. Um, most schools do offer some type of, um, for instance, I got one as as someone going in as a second career because I had already worked after undergrad uh, for a couple of years before going into chiropractic. Definitely the international. But there, if you look for them, there actually are quite a few for a couple thousand dollars here and there, which in the grand scheme of things with the interest rates of of 20-year loans can really be very helpful. Absolutely. Did you pursue any postgraduate uh, studies? Obviously, you're in research now. Uh, what was the path from chiropractic school to uh, research? Yeah, so I, I did not uh, pursue any type of postgraduate residency or fellowship at the time. Um, and as I recall from National College, the, there was a family practice residency, orthopedics, uh, radiology. There might have been uh, something else. But uh, uh, no, I didn't pursue those. But what I did do, and this may also be something uh, that uh, students out there uh, might appreciate, might be able to do at their schools, and that is um, National at the time allowed students to go uh, to the various um, diplomate courses. So, for example, uh, I could attend the uh, sports diplomate or the CCSP courses, the uh, uh, orthopedics, the uh, radiology, nutrition, that sort of thing as a student, and uh, I didn't have to pay for those. So that was uh, phenomenal. I ended up spending uh, many of our weekends... Um, uh, my wife is a chiropractor as well, so we went to these together, and um, it seemed like... Uh, uh, you know, uh, after a long week of class, it just seemed like these weekends were filled with, you know, some practical knowledge, um, and, and different kind of tips and tools that we could implement into practice. So, um, it kind of felt like we did uh, postgraduate while we were doing the graduate, while we were doing the chiropractic studies. Um, but, uh, to be honest with you, uh, when I was thinking about graduation, I, I really was not interested in, in research even. Uh, at the time, I, I was not interested in pursuing any postgraduate residencies. But uh, as I look at things now, I, I see the value, you know, with uh, looking at internships uh, at the VA and, and various things like that. So I, I think I would definitely take advantage of those things now. Those diplomat courses then were being taught at National? Or were these ones that you would travel that they were hosting elsewhere? No, I didn't end up traveling. Uh, these were all in-house. So whatever they had in-house, uh, and there were uh, quite a few, pretty much uh, every weekend there was something, whether it was orthopedics or sports or something like that. Uh, but another thing um, that I'll just mention also that I thought was pretty cool, uh, because we ended up uh, attending these diplomates, uh, we actually got to participate as, um, oh, um, I'm not sure what you call it, but uh, um, observers during the uh, diplomate exams, and we'd actually be uh, like a sample patient uh, demonstrating an injury, and and then that was pretty cool. So um, there, you know, there are many different ways to get involved at the school, uh, whether it's research or otherwise. But that that's one way we got involved, and in, and I thought it was really interesting because then you see a seasoned. Uh, you know, chiropractor who's been out in many cases for years in practice and, and you get to see what kind of skills and what kinds of uh, history taking they, they would do on a patient. That's interesting. So it sounds like you almost got uh, some opportunities to shadow without having to take the time to leave campus to go find clinics and, and spend time there. But you got to see experienced doctors uh, who came to you and showed their skills uh, while you were learning. Yeah. Yep. That's excellent. That'd be a great opportunity for, uh, for students you know, to I, take advantage of. 
I would have traveled, but I was so, so poor, Dr. Cash, and I didn't have a car. And so I did everything on campus. <laughs> so you make do with what you have. I, there's, you know, some previous guests who were traveling. I think they're going to national actually to do the, uh, the, um, internal medicine diplomat during school, you know, every, every weekend or every other weekend going for seminars. And, uh, yeah, that, that stuff can add up, especially when your tuition is already quite high. Do you have any, um, any suggestions for students who are considering chiropractic school? Uh, what is one of the most important things that you can think of to consider when choosing a school? Uh, well, uh, I, I probably wouldn't do it the way that I did. Um, I, I never even visited national before applying. In fact, I, the first time I saw the campus was when I showed up the weekend before classes started. Um, as far as what's the most important, I guess I'm of the opinion that your education is based upon what you put into it. So I don't think it is so much the school uh, as it is you. Uh, however, if it was me, I, I might consider going to a school where I could do a master's degree concurrently. Nowadays, uh, those are offered. Uh, for example, a master's in clinical research or exercise science or something like that. Um, I think in my case, it would have sped up the, the process a little bit. Um, and I think it would have been uh, perhaps more valuable getting taught uh, by chiropractors, uh, although there, there are pluses and minuses to that. But uh, I think being right there uh, would have been very valuable. So, um, you know, I, it's whatever you are looking for, I guess. If you're into nutrition, go to a school that, uh, you know, teaches a lot about that or or where you can get into maybe a diplomate course or take a master's degree in functional medicine or something like that. Um, so those would be the the important things. But as I said, I, I'm of the mindset that it is, uh, the education is what you put into it. Yeah, I, I agree that you can be successful whichever school you uh, you do choose to go to. You do have a master's and a PhD. Um, where did you go to get those? What was that experience like? Sure. So I'll just give you a little bit of uh, background on that. Uh, I, I said that I wasn't interested in research at all, really, when I got out of chiropractic college. I had no interest. Um, however, was, I did do a lot of reading. Of Exposure to research uh, in school, or what? Why weren't? Why did you have any interest? Because I'm just curious. Because a lot of people get turned off uh, of research because of the evidence based classes that we're forced to take. Yeah, I wonder. Um, I, I thought our class at National was pretty good. It was only a one or two credit class, so there wasn't a lot at the time. Um, and I did do a lot of reading. I mean, I was. I was a pretty big nerd, uh, hanging out at the library and things like that. Um, but I really wanted to practice. I, I really wanted to have hands on that. That's what I saw my career as being, uh, helping people just like I got helped. And so, you know, when I started to think about research, I, I had a couple of interesting cases in my practice, uh, things that I'd never thought I would see things that I thought I'd only hear about in textbooks. And uh, some of these cases started to improve with chiropractic care. And I thought, well, um, you know, I'm really uh, not sure what's going on, not sure why they're improving, but maybe I should study up on this. And so at the time, um, I had contacted my uh, uh, alma mater, uh, Miami University, and uh, inquired about a master's degree in exercise science. And uh, and and they were quite... Uh, pleased that I would apply. So I ended up taking the GRE and applying to Miami and we moved down to, uh, Ohio again. And so we took, uh, I took, uh, those classes. And after I was done with the masters in exercise science, I realized that I didn't know everything I wanted to. And I didn't feel confident to be honest with you with, uh, with my research skills. So I figured at that time that I better go on to do a PhD. Um, otherwise, I might do some research here and there, but it wouldn't be of the quality that uh, I would like to do. So on with the PhD. 
just to clarify, because you mentioned uh, Miami University, but this is a university in Ohio? Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> and uh, people at Miami University like to say that Miami University was uh, founded before Florida was a state. So uh, I just have to oh, throw really? that in there. Okay, okay. <laughs> Well, that clarifies another question. I was I was imagining you going back and forth between Florida and Ohio uh, to teach classes and do research and all that. But that no. that clarifies that. Okay. <laughs> so both your master's and your PhD were done at Miami University. Correct. Yeah, the master's degree was in exercise, but uh, we don't currently have a PhD program in exercise. So I was looking around. Uh, we had started a practice, my wife and I. And I didn't want to move because I thought, well, we just got this practice going and, you know, it seems to be going fairly well. So I didn't want to move. So I was looking around at Miami and I thought, well, what can I do? What can I study uh, to get this PhD? And it turned out that there was um, in the psychology department, several researchers that were interested in studying uh, posture, postural control and ergonomics. And so that's basically what I pursued uh, for the next uh, four or five years uh, in the psychology department. So my PhD is actually in psychology, but my uh, work, my focus is on motor behavior and essentially postural control. Interesting. So this, this uh, again, leads me to some of the other things that I'm curious to discuss because I think a lot of students may have a an interest in pursuing research, but in chiropractic, there just doesn't seem to be an established path for chiropractors to get involved. Uh, I, my first quarter, I went to the, the head of research at Western States, which is Mitch Hoffs, who you've had on the podcast, you know, and chatted with him. And his answer was come back to me in a couple of years <laughs> because he had so many students who would come and then get busy with classes uh, and so he uh, didn't didn't like to give uh, too much of a commitment to students. Um, you know, I've heard of others who are interested in doing a PhD, but just have no idea where to start. Is there a a recommended course? Uh, you know, whether it's a master's then a PhD, or is it pretty open to do whatever to be able to get in, involved in research? Yeah, I think that's a, a really important question. Um, unfortunately, there's no set pathway at this time for a chiropractor to get involved in research. I think a lot of it um, happens to be uh, through personal connections, just reaching out to chiropractic researchers. Um, in, in my case, uh, I actually didn't do that. I was just interested in learning how to do research in general. And so that's, that's how I ended up pursuing my master's degree at, at Miami. So there were, there were no chiropractors. Um, I was the, you know, I was the token chiropractor, uh, and I was a student there. So, um, I, I think, uh, I might've done it a little bit differently, but I, I think also that a lot of chiropractors end up doing that because we don't have the, uh, infrastructure currently to allow chiropractors to continue on with a PhD in, in close quarters with uh, a chiropractic university or a chiropractic college. So I, I think that's the way most end up going about it at this point. And actually, I think there are some positives to that. Um, we could maybe think of some negatives, you know, that uh, you're not at a chiropractic college, you don't have access to, uh, you know, student clinic or, or patients in the clinic or something like that. But um, I think the positives are that you you um, are focused in on your studies. You you get training with experts in whatever field you're you're going after, uh, and and you you spend the quality time doing that. And and what I've really appreciated um, since the PhD is that uh, uh, getting that degree and and, um, and working with others, for example, in the psychology department. Even though it wasn't, you know, when I took the position in psychology, I thought, well, you know, I never really saw myself as a psychologist per se. And I thought, well, what am I going to do, you know, with this? How am I going to advance chiropractic? Because that was my plan. 
but now that I look back on it, I think, wow, those experiences were really good because the the methods that psychologists use and the 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 skill sets that I learned, I can only uh, uh, apply them in a way that will help chiropractic now. So I, I think that's uh, uh, one advantage of just going through a traditional university. I think that's a great point. I think it, it can help to keep um, keep chiropractic research uh, pure in a way in that uh, the bias is a little less uh, likely to come in if if the methodologies are similar to what other researchers are doing outside of the field of chiropractic. So that's, that's great, but it, it also means it's a little more difficult. There's no um, easy way for a student to step into that research field and to start that's carving right. a path. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, another advantage, though, that I will point out of, of going through uh, you know, a traditional university um, and gaining experience with uh, a different profession um, is that you learn you learn the methods of that profession. And so, for example, some of the studies that I've done, I've basically just copied the methods that uh, psychologists have used uh, over time and just literally brought them into a chiropractic setting to use as kind of like pre and post testing. Um, so I, I basically use their outcome variables that they use in their experiments and, and apply them just directly to a chiropractic experiment. Excellent. I'm a huge fan of, uh, of that integration. I think, you know, as I read about geniuses and experts and the successful, it, it always comes down to uh, thinking in ways that other people haven't or, or bringing ideas and concepts from similarly or, or seemingly disparate fields and bringing them together in ways that are novel. So that really can be a huge benefit. I'd like to start talking about the podcasts that you've been doing. Um, I'm, I'm looking through a bunch of the episodes and again, just seeing names that many of us are familiar with. Uh, Greg Kotchuk, who excellent speaker, great research trip in Canada. Again, Scott Haldeman, um, Michael Schneider. Where, where did you get the idea to start this podcast? Well, it started with my chiropractic research mentor, Dr. Greg Kramer. He was my very first interview. And Dr. Kramer had been a big supporter of mine going through the PhD. Uh, I wanted to do an interview with him, and, and I told him about my idea, and he was, he was gung-ho to do it. Um, and the idea was, you know, let's just chat about your career and some of the research that you've done over the years. And at that point, I was really thinking that I would just have it basically as an archive for myself um, because I, I just was interested in, in learning more about him and, and, and uh, his research. But then I got to thinking that the interview went so well and I'd learned a lot from it. And I thought, how can I get this information out to other chiropractors? You know, I didn't really even know if anyone else would be interested in listening to these kinds of conversations but I decided to create the Chiropractic Science Podcast from uh, that first interview. And, and then I thought, well, um, you know, it, it really made me excited to, uh, to do them. So I did, I did a couple of more um, and had Katie Pullman on, who was my next um, podcast. And, and that was a great interview. And she was actually in my office live as we did that. So that was fun. Um, so I, then I started thinking, well, this could be an asset to the chiropractic profession to, to continue to do these because we, we have good researchers. We have, we have excellent research. And I didn't see that the research was getting out to the practitioner or to the patient uh, like I might have wanted it to be. So doing the podcast was a way for me to be able to talk about something that I like and be able to learn from other scientists uh, in the chiropractic profession, and then to be able to get the information out uh, from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So that's pretty much how it began. Very cool. Did you have any experience interviewing with radio or any other uh, uh, experiences like that that would lend to the podcast interview? 
Not at all. Um, what I did have was quite a few years of teaching experience as a uh, graduate uh, assistant, and then later as a visiting assistant professor at Miami University, and then subsequently a clinical faculty member. So I, I do a lot of talking with students, uh, you know, in groups of, let's say, 40 to 100 and some odd uh, each class. So I had that, and I, I really enjoy that. But um, I wanted to find a way to get out to to the masses, and this seemed to be uh, one way that I I figured I could do. Very cool. Um, I, last check, I think you're into about 19 episodes. Is that about right? Yes. Yeah. I just uh, we just had one with Dr. Alan Breen from the UK. Um, he's a biomechanist and fascinating interview about how. Um, how the spine moves, how you can quantify it with um, video fluoroscopy. And uh, it's really interesting technique. And, and it's always fascinating for me to interview all these different researchers and, and all the different methods that they use to, to try to put chiropractic on the map and, and figure out what, what chiropractic uh, does as we apply our intervention, um, as well as their thought process. That to me is actually uh, sometimes more revealing than just uh, what their research is all about. Yeah, and a lot of these are very timely. Um, I, I listened to the interview with Dr. Alan Breen earlier today, and I had gone for a run this morning, and I was kind of thinking through and remembering some visits to other chiropractic clinics, and there's a doctor who had a patient with a low back spasm. He said, do you know why this happens? And I, and I was, you know, he put me on the spot. I was a bit embarrassed in thinking, I said, oh, well, uh, you know, it depends on who you ask. McGill would say it's this. And he said, well, it's because the vertebrae aren't moving um, equally. There's, there's a difference in the amount of movement between the vertebrae. And I thought, really? Is that, you know, and, and of course, my mind, I'm a bit of a skeptic, always thinking about the research. Has this even been studied? Right. And sure enough, then I, then I pop on the podcast from Dr. Alan Breen, came, came on at the end of my run, and here he starts talking about spine dynamics and quantitative fluoroscopy. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have to really listen carefully to this. Well, Dr. Cashin, you know, I did that interview just for you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, there have been a few that I think have been specifically for me. Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, I believe it was another one of your interviews. I'm not remembering who it was uh, who talked about this this concept of knowledge transfer. Oh, yes. Dr. Boussier. Yes. And again, it was a, a concept where I used to work in education and I've I've kind of thought, how can I bring together these things of... of of information transfer and chiropractic and research. And then I listened to that po podcast and I realized there actually are positions now where there's a knowledge transfer specialist, someone who is uh, charged with the task of looking through the research, bringing that knowledge together and making it applicable to the clinician. I think that's so wonderful. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm totally biased, uh, but I think we need a lot more of that. I think so too. I think it's it, it's coming to be uh, it's becoming more popular in medicine and physical therapy, um, but definitely something that we need in chiropractic. Thinking through all the interviews you've done, uh, I know for me sometimes I get I get everything set up and I'm I'm quite nervous to do these interviews. Um, who has your favorite guest been so far? Oh, Dr. Cashin, I, I don't know that that's a fair question. Uh, <laughs> the truth of the matter is that, you know, same as you, I get a little nervous before. I get, I get nervous before each class that I teach as well. Uh, I don't think you ever fully get over that, and I think that's a good thing. But um, after I'm going through the interview, uh, the interview seemed to flow really well, and uh, I, don't, I don't know... Um, I've thought about this uh, many times, but I don't know that I can pick one. Uh, they're all good in their own respects, uh, at least from my opinion. So I'm not sure that I have a favorite. They certainly are all very good. Um, a couple that stand out to me are Heidi Havik. That's one that I've had flagged to go back and listen. I probably started to listen to it three times. And then I just keep thinking, I, I have to sit down and take notes on this. Otherwise, I'm not going to remember this. Um, and of course, Scott Haldeman, who... 
I, uh, I've mentioned many times on the podcast, I'm involved with World Spine Care, which is his uh, latest project. Well, um, you know, I, I think for me, uh, Dr. Haldeman, that was probably my most nerve wracking interview that I've had. And why is that? Well, um, so a long history uh, for me with Dr. Haldeman in terms of uh, even before chiropractic college, I I purchased his book. The um, uh, it's called the Principles and Practice of Chiropractic, and it's gone through several editions. But I read from front to back uh, his entire book before I got to chiropractic college, um, and I was I was so excited that I think it was this first or second weekend. Uh, once class started, Dr. Haldeman actually came to National and uh, gave a presentation. And it was the first time that I saw him in person. I was so amazed, uh, just in awe, basically. I recorded his talk uh, and I typed up pretty much every word he said. I was just, like I said, just in awe. And I recall during chiropractic schooling that I actually wrote to Dr. Haldeman, and this was pre-email days, so... <laughs> literally pen to the paper, send it to snail mail. And he actually replied to me. I said, you know, how much I appreciated all the work he does for chiropractors and whatnot. And he wrote back to me. It was a very, um, very pleasant, uh, uh, letter that he wrote back. And so I was, I was, it was really gracious. And, and that's been in my experience with him is just, uh, amazingly gracious and such a kind person. Um, so fast forward almost 20 years later and, uh, when I started this podcast, he, you know, he was on my mind. I, I really wanted to interview him, but it took me, I don't know, three or four months to get up the nerve just to ask him to be on the podcast. <laughs> and, and when I did true, true to form, Dr. Haldeman was, you know, very gracious. And, and he said, Oh, it would be a pleasure to participate on your podcast. So, um, and it all went well, but, uh, for sure I was nervous on that one. Well, you've got me beat. It's been three years since I've been doing mine, and I still have not gotten up the nerve to call him. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, he he's a remarkable individual. I've read his biography, uh, written by Reed Phillips, and you know, one thing that stood out to me is that he he was a very uh, very avid and dedicated letter writer. He's always always written many, many letters. Uh, and I believe he keeps carbon copies of most of that correspondence, at least before email. Um, and you know, it's, it's something that I'm curious if you've noticed any patterns because writing is one that I've seen as a common, uh, characteristic of many researchers. For instance, I interviewed Dr. Don Murphy, uh, that episode just came out and he has been a prolific writer. Scott Haldeman has written, I don't, I don't know if you can count the number of articles and books. As you've interviewed these other researchers, does that st stand out to you? Or are there any other characteristics that seem to be consistent? Well, the, the writing, um, what, just to give you my own experience, uh, I don't think I was ever a, a great writer, uh, by any means, but the, the master's and the PhD programs really drill it into you. And, uh, with, after about 35 revisions of, uh, my dissertation, you kind of get a little bit better and you have, uh, you know, your committee helping you out. Uh, so from that, uh, I must deduce that, uh, these other researchers have gone into a similar path. Uh, what I find is that my writing is, tends to be very to the point. Um, I tend not to belabor the point, but, um, just get to the point. And so it tends to be kind of dense writing. And, and whenever I read, uh, chiropractic researchers, uh, papers, uh, I also encounter the same kind of writing. It's very dense. Um, and you know, there are some pieces of jargon that, uh, that creep in from the various fields that they've studied, for example, biomechanics or epidemiology or the like. And, uh, so, uh, I think that's probably true that everybody just learns whether they like the writing aspect of it, uh, or not. I've come to appreciate it, but I'm not sure it's my favorite thing. 
I, I love the concept of writing and I'm always looking, of course, I also love technology. So I'm always looking for new technologies that help to write. In fact, I just found one today, an Indiegogo campaign uh, called The Write Margin, which is an app that keeps track of your goals and all these things. But when it comes down to it, the process of writing is something I've always struggled with. It, can you think of any suggestions for students how they may begin getting into that habit of writing? Mm. Um, well, I think there's, uh, there's really no replacement for just sitting down and, uh, and coming up with something. Um, maybe take, uh, you know, take a, a concept that, um, you've had happen to you today or an experience that you've had happen, uh, and then try to put that into words. I think something like that and doing that on a regular basis, even if it doesn't take you, um, that long, or you're just going to write a few sentences, I think, think some, uh, reflection, uh, in that kind of way is, a is a very powerful technique to, uh, to master the writing skills, so to speak. So, um, I, I, that, that would be my recommendation. Do you personally have a writing habit or is it just whenever the need comes up? Uh, for me now, it's pretty much whenever the need comes up, I'll go into spurts where I'll do weeks on end of, uh, lots of writing. I, I do, uh, chiropractic continuing education seminars. So I, I write for that. Um, I, I write, uh, or help write journal publications, um, certainly writing all day for, uh, my notes in the, in the office. I still practice part-time. So seems like I'm always writing and uh, it seems like my wrists are starting to pay the price actually. <laughs> so uh, maybe I need to explore you, that software that you're, that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess my recommendation would be to learn the Dvorak keyboard layout. <laughs> if anyone's familiar with that, I I'm revealing how much of a geek I am. Um, but certainly takes some strain off. Uh, do you use any tools? Do you write by hand uh, pen and paper or do you prefer the computer? I definitely prefer computer. Um, for my chiropractic notes, I find that I'm doing more with uh, uh, software programs like Dragon Naturally Speaking. Um, mm -hmm. I tend to write my emails back to students at the university with uh, Dragon. Uh, I try to organize my time so I get on the computer and, and write emails at a particular time of the day. Not always, but um, I, I try to do those things and then it it takes some of the strain off of my hands and whatnot, because it just seems like I'm constantly at the computer. I don't personally like being at the computer just because I've done it so much. Um, so I'm looking for alternatives. So if, uh, if anybody out there has, uh, suggestions, I, I would surely appreciate it. Dragon naturally speaking certainly helps. And I know they have an iPhone app now that will synchronize to your desktop so you can, dictate on the go and then automatically pull it in when you get back to your computer. That's great. Um, kind of coming back to this idea of, of characteristics that you may note of similarities between researchers, you know, I was listening to the interview with uh, William Weeks a few weeks back. I, I think this came out quite a while ago, but I'm pretty far behind. And there was one, one thing that he said that, that really, almost stopped me in my tracks. And you had asked him about his recommendation for students. And he said, I love what I do. I get to sit around and think all day. So if you like doing that, research is great work. And I think it, it caused me pause because I love to sit and think. And I find when I'm having a busy day in the clinic, I don't get that opportunity. And, uh, and I start to really miss it. Uh, and so that's one moment where I started to really consider whether research was something that I should pursue. Uh, does that fit in your uh, experience of research? Is it is it sitting around and thinking all day, or is there more to it than that? Well, for me, sitting around all day is not going to pay the bills, so I I don't do that. <laughs> um, I. Uh, you know, I, I teach, I, I do research. It's kind of a part-time thing for me. Um, so I, I teach full-time. I still have a practice part-time. 
I do continuing ed. It seems like my days filled up. And so maybe that's one of the reasons I do the podcast, maybe to generate some ideas and, and talk with the best of the best. Um, but no, I, I don't, I don't sit around and think of these things. Usually my best ideas come when I'm at lunch, let's say with a person or, uh, or I'm in an altered state of mind, like I've had a few adult beverages or something like that. <laughs> uh, or I'm really tired and I want to go to bed and I can't, I can't go to bed because I'm thinking about a study that I want to conduct. Let's talk a little bit more about your research. Uh, you, you've mentioned you focus on human movement, coordination, posture. Uh, what are some of the... Um, key research studies you've been involved in and what are you researching right now? Yeah. So, um, like I said, um, my, my life since graduation with a PhD has been essentially teaching. Uh, I do research part-time and I'm, I'm still active in the office, uh, pretty much every day seeing patients. So, um, I get ideas from patients that I see, clinical encounters. Um, I do research uh, primarily, well, my interest is in the effect of chiropractic on movement. And so many of my studies have looked at, uh, for example, um, the, the most recent study that we're getting ready to present at DC 2017, which is a huge chiropractic research conference. And uh, any students out there who are interested in uh, finding out how you might become involved in research, I'd highly encourage you to go to that dc2017.org. Uh, we'll give you all the information. Um, but uh, the presentation that we're doing there, we looked at uh, military special operations forces uh, from Fort Campbell uh, in Kentucky, uh, the base there. And the, the goal of that study was to determine if chiropractic adjustments uh, had some kind of effect on simple reaction times, choice reaction times, as well as uh, more complicated response times. And so uh, we're, we're, like I said, we're getting ready to uh, present that, uh, and we should be ready to um, send that out to uh, journal for submission very soon. Uh, so that's uh, the most recent study. Um, I've done studies looking at, for example, um, something called Fitts Law, F-I-T-T-S. Um, and Dr. Fitz was a, uh, a psychologist. And uh, so here we're bringing into some psychology back into uh, chiropractic. And uh, what Fitts Law is, is a relationship, a mathematical relationship between uh, the size and distance of a target and how fast you can move between these targets. And so imagine if you had two circles on your computer screen and a cursor that you could click back and forth between these two circles and you could manipulate the height or the width of these circles um, to make them smaller, it would make it harder to get to these circles. And if you enlarge the circles, it would make it easier. So movement time would um, uh, get faster if you had really big targets to go to. So we've done several experiments, uh, several studies where we looked at the effect of, for example, chiropractic as well as exercise. I, I'm in an exercise department, so I look at exercise as well. So we've looked at both uh, of these interventions on the performance during Fitts Law. And what we found is that uh, chiropractic adjustments uh, seem to speed the movement time uh, during those tasks and exercise does very similar. In fact, the, uh, percentage improvement was almost identical around 9% improvement in each of those studies that we did. Um, so those are, those are some studies, uh, recently as well. I've done a study looking at, uh, the effect of a, an ultra, uh, endurance run, uh, mm. on, postural control. So we, we were at a, uh, ultra marathon and we just hung out there with our, uh, portable force plate and we checked uh, posture before and after the run. Um, we also collected data on, uh, body composition. So percentage fat and, and, uh, things like this. And that was a really interesting study. Got to work with some of my uh, colleagues on that paper. And certainly, as you might expect, 
uh, the postural control changed, uh, changed to one in which the, the sway became more apparent in uh, a forward and backward kind of direction. And people kind of tightened oh, up. Okay. Yeah, people kind of tightened up on the medial lateral or the side to side control. Uh, they mm-hmm. weren't they weren't as willing to sway from side to side after the endurance run. So that that may be uh, just because as you're running, obviously you're moving in the sagittal plane. Uh, so you know forward mm-hmm. and backward, and and so maybe that was something that's uh, entrained or. Uh, fatigue mechanisms, or maybe multiple explanations for that, but uh, that's another study that we looked at. Very interesting. I've done a couple of ultras, uh, and I, I have a great photo of about I think twenty miles into a fifty k, where my <laughs> my posture control is just way off. <laughs> uh, it, it does go towards the end of the race. Can, what race was this at? Are you able to mention that? Yeah, yeah. It was at the Stone Steps in Cincinnati. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I've had the uh, father of of trail ultra running, Gordon Ainsley, on the podcast. Um, And some people may have heard of him from starting the Western States 100 trail run. But he actually is a chiropractor. And so he's the uh, credited with being the first person to run um, an ultra marathon on the trails which happens every year down in Auburn, California. So that was really a pleasure to have him. He's uh, quite a spunky guy being in his, I believe, in his 70s now and still starting the race every year. Very cool. Um, back to the the study on Fitz Law. Um, I'm, I'm curious, did you, did you evaluate the the duration of that effect. So it sounded like exercise and the adjustment had a similar effect. Were they lasting or was this just an immediate outcome that you were looking at? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in both of the studies, they were immediate. Um, in the military study that I was telling you about, we'll be presenting here in, in March in DC. Uh, we also incorporated Fitz law as one of the tests. Uh, and that was, uh, a little bit longer duration. We checked that over multiple visits. Uh, so that'll be the first longer term uh, study, I guess you might say. Uh, but even between visits there, we're looking at maybe a week or two weeks, something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, where the where the effects seem to be greatest is obviously right after the adjustment. Um, and we expect the same to be true for exercise. Uh, if you look at the exercise literature, um, seems like the effect of exercise on insulin regulation or anything, uh, maybe insulin regulation, not the best example, but anything motor control wise, it seems to be relatively short lived. And so oftentimes I'll hear chiropractors say, well, you know, how long does it last? If it only lasts 20 or 30 minutes or an hour or five hours, it it may not be worth much. Um, I disagree. Uh, I think that, um, you know, exercise is something that, uh, you know, if you can get an effect and you can get an effect on a, a regular basis by engaging in exercise, that's good to know. Um, certainly not saying that people have to be adjusted every uh, 20 minutes, <laughs> but uh, if it can get you back on track uh, so that you can incorporate more exercise and these sorts of things, uh, then I think it has real value. And uh, I'm not sure it has to be a, an everlasting effect. Uh, and I think it's actually perhaps unrealistic to think that it would have a a really long lasting effect. This is a question from one of my listeners who asks, uh, in your opinion, what should chiropractic researchers focus on in the future? Where do you think we will generate the best returns on our research investments? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I I think that there's no one area that chiropractic research needs to focus on. Rather, I think what we need to do is to have a research culture, to engender a research culture that starts from being a student uh, and perpetuates all the way through being a practitioner in practice every day. And as a part of that, what I see is that we need research on pretty much everything. Uh, 
we certainly need innovative techniques. Uh, we need to continue what we're doing, uh, looking at musculoskeletal domains. We need to continue looking at uh, non-musculoskeletal effects. Uh, like I say, I'm, I'm biased. I, I think we need to look at performance measures, biomechanics, uh, the psychosocial. So I don't think there's uh, any one particular domain that we need to focus in on. Rather, I think we need to continue what we're doing, uh, perhaps design better studies. Uh, that might be one focus to really improve on the quality of our studies. But I don't see any one area being most important because to answer scientific questions, you have to have a, a wide range of methods and, and there's no one study that is going to do it for us. Um, no one study is going to quote unquote prove, uh, or disprove for that matter, chiropractic, uh, rather we need multiple studies and, you know, guidelines, uh, can have a significant effect, um, some journal articles can have significant effects like a systematic review that goes through lots of uh, randomized clinical trials. But to have that kind of impact, you need a broad base of studies. And so I don't think there's any one kind of study. How, how do you propose, what are some steps that you could propose that would help to develop that research culture? Well, uh, one thing is, uh, in terms of, let's talk about the research itself. Um, I think we need to invest a lot of money into chiropractic research. I think governments, uh, from all over the world are not going to invest into the kinds of questions that chiropractors have an interest in. So I think it's incumbent upon chiropractors themselves, chiropractors in practice, chiropractic organizations, chiropractic colleges to invest heavily in our research. Um, apart from that, I think uh, at the chiropractic college level and for students, we need to um, perhaps engender more of uh, uh, that might involve classes dealing with uh, evidence-based practice and, and how to read research articles. It may involve the students taking some initiative, uh, themselves, uh, with the encouragement of faculty, uh, maybe for example, setting up, uh, colloquiums in the chiropractic colleges where you can hear about current research that's going on. There are a lot of can different you, ways. Can you explain what is a colloquium? <clears throat> oh, sure. So a colloquium uh, is basically uh, just a learned talk, uh, usually by an expert that would come in and, and talk about some research project that uh, might be going on uh, that they're interested in that they're conducting or may have already conducted. Um, people have uh, also incorporated uh, like what you might call a brown bag uh talk uh, where, for example, students might get together uh, by themselves or with faculty uh, or with a researcher uh, and talk about studies. Um, for example, just distribute uh, ahead of time a particular study that uh, uh, you might have interest in. And, um, and then you talk about the methods or you talk about the discussion, you talk about things that interest you. Um, I think that might be one way to to get uh, students interested in research. But I think there has to be an infrastructure at the level of the college itself to incorporate evidence-based practice into the curriculum more uh, to get, for example, researchers, big names in the field to come and, and talk to students, get them involved, get them interested. Um, I'm not sure of all the ways to do it. Uh, those might be a few different ways, but what I do know is that it would be a very powerful tool and uh, we, we ultimately need to boost our research uh, base in this profession. Have you considered the role of crowdfunding for chiropractic research? Um, you know, I'm not really sure what crowdfunding is. Perhaps you can explain it to me. Sure. So it's very common in, in the arts, in entertainment, uh, with these websites such as Kickstarter or Indiegogo, where if somebody has a great product idea but doesn't have the 
capital to start up a business, they post it online. They say, this is my idea. Here's some prototypes. Uh, here's what we plan to make. And if people like the idea, they contribute, whether that's simply, uh, um, you know, giving a few dollars just to help get it off the ground or potentially to buy the first run of products. And that then builds the capital for the people to start the project. And I've, I've come across now and then a couple of websites that are trying to do similar things. Uh, I just did a quick search and experiment.com, um, is trying to do this. So crowdfunding, uh, is just a way to get private and public funds, uh, into a particular research project. Well, that's a terrific idea. Uh, I really like how you explained that. Um, there are a few, um, uh, people that are doing this. Um, uh, for example, I know Palmer college has a, uh, I believe it's called the 2020 campaign. And mm, so yes, it's a, it's an online place that you can donate towards, uh, Palmer chiropractic research. Um, Dr. Heidi Havik, uh, who um, we talked about earlier, um, is a researcher from New Zealand, and she's got a very innovative way of uh, generating research dollars. She um, does uh, seminars. She travels around the world uh, telling people about her research, um, and people make donations uh, to her research organization. They can purchase posters and uh, videos and these sorts of things. So I think that's a, that's one way to get the job done for sure. And I think it's a very innovative uh, way to do that. I think any of these ways uh, can certainly work. Um, and to me, it doesn't really matter, I guess, uh, so much, you know, whether you're using crowdfunding or doing seminars or the like, but um, I think we're going to see a whole lot more of that because, frankly, uh, from what I've seen, you know, governments, I don't think, are all that concerned about answering chiropractic research questions or chiropractic questions in general. So I think we as a profession are just going to have to step up to the plate and, uh, and, and donate to whoever uh, you think is going to do a good job if you have a particular research organization within the profession. But uh, I think we need to uh, donate in a very large way to to, to continue this because I think it's, uh, I think it's going to be a major player in, you know, whether we're in guidelines in the future or whatnot, uh, and just supporting the profession as a whole. So we can see more people. That's one of the reasons I do the podcast. So we can get this information out so that we can ultimately get to more people and help more people. It's, it's kind of an exciting uh, prospect. I think there's opportunity there for some creative and enterprising uh, young graduates to find ways to fund the next wave of chiropractic research. I think that'll, that, that gets me very hopeful that we have individuals like you and all these other researchers out there trying to find new ways to push the envelope. I'm more jazzed up than ever. We, we have some amazing researchers in this profession. Um, and I know that if we get some funding and, and frankly, some projects don't take a lot of funding. Uh, I funded many of my own projects through the PhD and even shortly thereafter, uh, from, you know, my own practice and, uh, small funds that I could get, uh, I was fortunate to get, uh, the foundation for chiropractic education and research, uh, to provide me a fellowship as I went through the PhD. So, some of that kind of funding, it wasn't a lot of funding, but it was enough to accomplish several studies. And so, uh, you know, our chiropractic researchers uh, tend not to make a, a ton of money. And uh, they, from my experience, they do it because they, they love this profession and uh, just be nice to get more research out there. Well, I'd like to wrap things up again. Really appreciate you being on the podcast. I always like to end with a tick pick, which is a recommendation for students uh, that they can go out and whether it's a textbook, a seminar, or something they can pick up and improve their chiropractic knowledge. Is there anything recently you've come across uh, or any favorite resources that you'd like to share? Well, that's a great question. Um, and Nothing really. I guess I, I search across a, a lot of 
uh, books and, um, and readings and websites. Um, my, my, uh, thought is to just utilize PubMed. It's free. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, I tend in, in my practice to have lots of questions after I see patients even 20 years into practice. And so I use PubMed. Excellent. Any, uh, uh, expert tips for how to go about doing a search? Do you just use that first search bar that comes up and type in some keywords, or do you maybe use the clinical queries or or any type of tool on PubMed? Uh, yes, and yes, I use both. Um, if I have a uh, well thought out clinical query, I, I will use the clinical queries function uh, in PubMed. Otherwise, if I'm just doing a quick and dirty uh, search, so to speak. I'll just type in some keywords. I may use uh, uh, some some terms and or not, uh, for example, in my searches to try to filter out things. And then oftentimes when I do a quick search, I usually limit things to review articles. Uh, so that's that's one thing that, uh, that I do. And that gives me a broad overview of what's going on in the field. And then if I find something interesting in the review articles, then I'll or start lurking for um, particular articles. Okay, that's a good tip. Good tip. Well, Dr. Smith, where can listeners find you if they'd like to follow you online or find more information about you? Yeah, so you can go to chiropracticscience.com. Uh, that's where you'll find the podcast. You can certainly find the podcast on, on iTunes. Um, and if you are interested in finding out about my practice, essenceofwellness.com. If you're interested in the university, you can search for me at Miami University. I will include links to all of those in the show notes. Thanks again for coming on Exploring Chiropractic. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and to get to know your research better. Thank you so much. Remember to check out Hover's simple domain registration without the hassle exploring chiropractic.com slash hover. If you've enjoyed exploring chiropractic, I have two requests to help make future episodes of the podcast possible. Number one, head over to iTunes and write a review. Five stars would be great, but whatever you think it's worth, writing reviews helps more people hear about the podcast. And number two, I've just created a Patreon page. If you haven't heard about Patreon, it's kind of like GoFundMe or Kickstarter, but for ongoing creative projects, just like a podcast. As a patron of Exploring Chiropractic, you can pledge to contribute $1, $5, $10 per episode, or whatever dollar amount you choose, and you can set a monthly maximum. These contributions will help make further episodes of the show possible. In return, you will get behind the scenes looks, sneak peeks at upcoming episodes, the ability to ask your own questions to the guests, and more. If you'd like to help make further episodes of Exploring Chiropractic possible, please go to patreon.com slash exploringchiro. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com 